Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm extremely pleased to be able to pursue tonight in adjournment proceedings one of the most important questions I've ever asked in this place, which was to the Prime Minister on October 16th. The night before, we had held in this place a quite extraordinary emergency debate, uh, thanks to the Speaker's ruling that it was, in fact, an, uh, qualifying as an emergency, that the IPCC, the United Nations Agency of the World's Best Scientists, had just delivered a report that warned humanity that unless we held global average temperature increase to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, we could face unimaginable consequences up to and including the loss of human civilization and potentially our own extinction. I, I put it to the Prime Minister that on the eve of the climate negotiations in Poland, now is the time to improve our targets. The IPCC report made it very clear that Canada's targets were wholly and are wholly inadequate to the task ahead of us. The good news I must stress, Mr. Speaker, from the IPCC report is that we still have time to avoid those consequences but we no longer have time for procrastination. Now, of course, events have taken place since then. The climate negotiations with, with, in, within which I participated in December in Kotowice, Poland, are over. Uh, Canada did not step up to improve our targets, and I have to say, uh, not just lamentably, but shamefully, the only countries that improved their targets were Fiji and the Marshall Islands. But it is very clear that we must take a role of global leadership, and where other countries are not improving their targets, surely Canada, with the weakest targets within the OECD, must do so. Now, the Prime Minister's response to me was to say, and I quote, we are working hard to meet our 2030 targets. I want to stress that these 2030 targets which, to which Canada is now committed have not changed since May 2015, when the former government of Stephen Harper placed them on with the United Nations. And now we know from the IPCC report that the targets we put forward are not just inconsistent with the Paris Agreement, they're dangerous and reckless. The Prime Minister went on to say, uh, we, are, uh, we are reversing the Conservatives' reckless changes. And I put it to my friend, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the most reckless change of the Harper administration was to cancel Kyoto and weaken our targets, not once, but three times. And we have now embraced, and the Liberal government has now embraced, the weakest of the targets from the three times Stephen Harper changed them. They are clearly inconsistent with the Paris Agreement. They clearly don't take us to 1.5 degrees Celsius. In fact, it's been calculated by other scientists that if all countries on Earth were pursuing Canada's weak efforts, global average temperature would go to 5.1 degrees Celsius or well past the danger zone. We now know that we have very little time. We know that other levels of jurisdiction within Canada are recognizing this is a climate emergency. Halifax just did, Vancouver has done, other cities are considering it. And yet in this place, it seems as though the major political party with the most seats in this place thinks we can just pretend till we get through the next election that the Harper targets are good enough, that the small efforts being made by the Liberal Party and the government, for which I am grateful that they're not as weak as the Conservatives, but if they lead us to extinction, in the end, it won't make a difference. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and as always, it's a pleasure to engage in a thoughtful debate with my colleague representing Saanich Gulf Islands, and I'll take this opportunity to recognize on the record for the first time uh, and congratulate her on her upcoming nuptials. Um, Canadians know that the uh, impacts of climate change are, are very real. We see them in our communities every day, and we need to take them very seriously. Uh, we understand the importance of limiting uh, the temperature increase to one and a half degrees, uh, as examined in the IPCC report uh, that the Honourable Member has referred to. Um, and that's why we supported the, uh, the goal of one and a half degrees in, in Paris. And with uh, a significant discussion around targets, the, the real target that I'm most concerned with is one and a half degrees that's going to prevent uh, a, cat a catastrophe that could render our, our planet uh, potentially uninhabitable for future generations. 
Uh, the government of Canada knows that uh, growing the economy uh, can be done while we protect the environment. I had the opportunity to take part in a panel uh, with the honourable member this morning where we discussed, in fact, uh, protecting the environment can lead to economic growth. Uh, we have made uh, significant progress in implementing our, our pan-Canadian framework on climate change. Uh, and in December of this year, we published the second annual progress report that details some of the work uh, that's been done so far. Uh, and the focus in the short term is on doing the things that we can do that will have the maximum impact. Uh, I note in particular that we've implemented new regulations to help significantly reduce, uh, reduce methane emissions uh, from heavy-duty vehicles and accelerate, importantly, the uh, phase-out of uh, coal-fired electricity. And by 2030, I anticipate we're going to have 90% of our electricity generated by renewable resources. We've released a clean fuel sta uh, standard regulatory design paper for consultation. Uh, we've made significant investments in clean technology, innovation and green infrastructure that's going to drive growth, uh, growth while we reduce uh, pollution. Uh, I don't want to just rhyme off a list of accomplishments, but suffice it to say uh, that we're focusing on the things that are going to make the biggest difference. And of course, uh, the price on pollution that we're introducing is a, a marquee policy of the government that's going to be the most effective tool we have in the toolkit. And uh, you don't have to take my word for it. You can look at the many endorsements of this approach from groups like the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, uh, a number of economists in the United States, and Nobel Prize winners, to say the least. Uh, our analysis found that uh, pollution pricing alone in Canada is going to reduce uh, pollution by between 50 and 60 uh, megatons. This is a, a single policy that's going to have a significant impact. Uh, we're always going to be looking to what other policies we can be adopting to go further and do more and achieve the deep decarbonization that we need to ensure that we don't put our planet's health at, uh, in, in the way of irreparable harm. Uh, in certain provinces, of course, uh, there is pushback against the, uh, the policy that we're trying to implement, uh, but we won't be stopped uh, because there's uh, a lack of political will uh, to implement what we know is the most effective uh, policy we can do to reduce our emissions. Uh, we remain committed to meeting our, our target of 2030. We want to achieve uh, at maximum that one and a half degree uh, limit that we discussed in, in the Paris Agreement and we're going to work with our, our partners both across Canada and as part of the international community to try to get more people and more countries on board to ensure that emissions are coming down so that we all have a safe planet to inhabit not just in this generation uh, but going forward for our kids and grandkids as well. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As, as has been the government's response on every occasion, it's as though what we're doing now were enough, while at the same time they recognize it's not enough. It's, a, it's an extreme case of cognitive dissonance. I, I have been so moved by the statements by the young Swedish uh, schoolgirl, uh, Greta Thunberg. She recently spoke at Davos, at the World Economic Forum, and she said, our house is on fire. I want you to panic. Now, if a house is on fire, and I'll continue with her metaphor, and you have people on the roof who need rescuing, and they're on a four-story roof, and people rush forward with a stepladder, the assembled crowds won't cheer for the stepladder. Our house is on fire, and the government policies to date are the stepladder. You can't reach the fourth floor unless you aim for it. We need to improve our target. We need to do it now. As Goethe Thornberg said, first we have to panic. Then we have to act. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'm familiar with the, uh, the, the speech to which the Honourable Member refers, and, and I uh, appreciate the, the point of view. I think in the face of great danger, my, my preference is, is not to panic, but to start doing the most that we can as soon as we can. That's why we're advancing some of the policies that I outlined in my initial response. But I want to point out as well that it's not just government that's going to help us get there. There's uh, opportunities for enormous progress when we look at uh, the private sector, the ability to innovate uh, and then accelerate uh, with the, the government's help, the adoption of technologies uh, like electric vehicles. Uh, we can be looking at uh, op uh, groups like Carbon Cure in my home province of Dartmouth, which is sequestering carbon and turning it into uh, to concrete forms. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we can be looking uh, at partnering with groups across Canada to help uh, advance sequestration by transforming our landscape. We're always going to be open to doing uh, what we can, when we can, as quickly as we can, and working with those to take us further and further than we, uh, from, as compared to where we currently stand today. Thank you very much. 